thank you very much, everyone. And it's lovely to see some of the my old friends and, and colleagues and all of your lovely faces. And I'm looking forward to the time when we can travel again and I can actually come around and, and see you all. So today we're going to talk about um, finances, wealth, income, um, because as Pauline said, it, it's quite relevant today and, and some people are having a very difficult time. Before I get into that, Pauline wanted me to um, make you aware of a, uh, a couple of awards we've actually won in the last uh, two days. On Monday, if you can see my screen, we were given an international award by an international company called Corporation 2020, and we were recognized for the best in life and corporate coach training. And we also won yesterday, and we didn't enter this, we were entered by third parties, and 310,000 people voted, and we got 61,000 votes worldwide. And we were, and this is an organization called the SME UK. So this is the UK, United Kingdom Award. So UK Enterprise from the SME, small to medium enterprise, and they awarded us the best life and corporate coach training for 2020. So absolutely delighted that, you know, we did that. Um, and it's, it's a nice way to brighten up our day. So today we're going to talk about money, financial success and goal achievement. I've been asked to speak for one hour and I normally do a whole day on this. So I'm going to cram as much as I can in and I'm going to talk quickly. So forgive me, and then we can ask questions at, at the end. We are recording it, so we can make the recording available to you as well. So let's, let's look at what do we mean by success, by achievement. You see, what you have to understand is money, finance, money is a form of energy. Money is part of this universe. It's part of this quantum universe that we live in. And money, like anything, like love, like health, like wellness, like recognition, like, find, like being a good parent, love, money, health, all of that can be achieved exactly the same. So we don't necessarily have to focus on money. What we do have to do is focus on understanding the way that the world works the way that the universe works. And once you know that, once you know the law, the rules, then you're in a position to actually set a goal and achieve anything you want. Not just money and wealth, but health, love, you name it. So let's look at the way the world works. First of all, everyone here went to school and you probably learned about things called physical laws and the laws of chemistry and Archimedes law and, and all of this and laws of mathematics. But you may or may not know that there are also natural laws. And there's one called the law of money. There are, there are in fact, 54, 54 natural laws. One is called the law of love. One is called the law of money. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to know how the, the, the law of money works? And by the way, if it's a law, an LAW, and you do this 100 times, how many times will it work out of 100? The answer is 100. If something only works 99 times out of 100, it cannot be called a law. So I find it very, very motivating, and I find it I found out about these 20, when I was 27, 28 years of age. And when I found out about these natural laws and I started to apply them, it changed my life dramatically. Absolutely dramatically. I, am, I grew up in Southern Ireland in a, a very small town and in a very, very poor family. And my father died when I was 11. Uh, we had no money, so I had to go out to work. I started my working life when I was 11. And in Southern Ireland, back in those days, and most of you are far too young, you wouldn't know, but it was a, 
quite quite a religious community, very strong Catholic. And we were absolutely, it was drilled into us, drilled into us that being poor was good and that God loved the poor. And that if you were rich, actually there was something wrong with you. And if you were rich, actually you probably, Yeah, if you were rich, you probably got your money in a bad way, you know? And, and we were always told, don't worry about being poor. Don't worry. God loves the poor. And don't worry because you'll get your reward in the next life. And I don't know if anyone here can relate to that. Or if anyone, and you can, if you nod, I'll, I'll see you nodding. So we, I was programmed from an early age into actually believing deep inside me that being wealthy was wrong and it took me not years it took me a couple of decades to actually reverse that conditioning um so and then i did and i, I was lucky to come up i had mentors i read books and i started to realize the way the universe really works so let me just give you a few simple hints here we can't cover all 54 laws in life, and this might upset you, and I'm not, I'm not here to upset you. I'm here to tell the truth. In life, you do not get what you want. In life, you do not get what you need. Now, it's a simple fact, and it's a very sad fact. And if it wasn't that way, there would be no poor, starving children. But in life, you don't get what you want. You don't get what you need. What you do get every single time is what you expect. So you always get what you expect at a deep cellular level, not just a conscious, not conscious level, at a subconscious level. And I won't go into it today, but even at a higher conscious level. So you don't get what you want. You don't get what you need. You do always get what you expect. There are a lot of misconceptions about money, a huge amount. And I used to believe all these, this when I was, we, were, we, we even had little parables and sayings, some, something to do with, it's easier for a, a, you know, a, a rich man to get into heaven than it is to, to get through the eye of a needle and a camel to get through the eye of a needle. And, and just all of these sayings that were there to indoctrinate people into believing that having wealth was not a good thing. So one of the first myths is, and you often hear people say this, they say, what you don't know won't hurt you. Well, I have to tell you, it's the opposite. Ladies and gentlemen, what you don't know actually will hurt you. Ignorance, have you ever heard the saying, ignorance is bliss? Anyone put your hands up if you've heard that? Yeah, I see a lot of hands up. Let me tell you now, no, absolutely not. Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance will kill you. It will kill you financially, health-wise, love-wise. Everything you want in life, ignorance will get in the way. So ignorance is not bliss. And here's another one that people talk about a lot. They say money is the root of all evil. Anyone ever heard that? Yeah. Thank you. Well, it comes from a book, a wonderful book, a book 2,000 years old that many religions, you, you know, there are five religions of the book, but in the original book, it never said that. The original statement is love. In fact, it's excess, excess love of money is the root of all evil. So it's love of money, not money itself. So I just want you to take that on board. Now, in this wonderful universe that you and I live in, an electric universe, a universe of magnetism, electromagnetism, a universe of quantum physics, what does the word quantum mean? In quantum mechanics, in quantum physics, you can travel from point A to point B instantly. There is no journey, there is no time you go from a to b instantly no matter what the distance and in the laws of quantum physics getting from where you are to getting 
wealth or love or health, you can do it almost instantly. You don't have to wait ten decades. So at the bottom of my slide, it says anything the mind of man that the mind of man can conceive and believe he can achieve and i want you to take that on board anything and i do mean anything that the mind of man can conceive and believe it has to be both you can achieve so let's let's move on now to general principles of goals and if you, if you want to set a goal to be incredibly wealthy that's perfectly okay because you can do more good in the world with money than you can do without money you can help an awful lot more people if you have wealth than if you do not have wealth so you can be a force for good if you have created wealth for you and your family so let's first of all look at this what is a goal what is a goal well some of you might be a bit shocked at this but a goal is actually a type of obsession. It's a type of obsession. And it's not a bad thing. And in fact, I will go so far as to say you must be obsessed with what it is you are setting your goal on. If it isn't an obsession, it's simply a shopping list. It's simply a wish list. Let me give you an example. All of you here on this call today, men and women, all different ages, I want you to think back to the very first love of your life. A boy, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, when maybe you were a teenager, but the very first love of your life. Let me ask you this. Were you infatuated with that boy or girl? You can put your hand up if the answer is yes. Yeah. And when you woke up in the morning, what was the first thing you thought of? Was it that boy or girl? Yeah. During the day, when you're doing either at school or work, whatever age you are, what were you constantly thinking about? That other person. And late at night. And how many of you can remember those long phone calls? Those long, long phone calls that went on and on. And, 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 and your mother would be standing in the hallway saying, for God's sake, hang up. Stop it. And, and you would go on and on talking about really nothing. But just being on the phone with that person. Can anyone remember those calls or is it just is it just me you know so you you met someone you this boy this girl that you just thought the world of you wanted to be with you thought they were just magnificent you were obsessed and it not in a bad way so we we must not equate necessarily obsession with a bad thing so and maybe maybe then you got the boy or girl you know and you became uh, a couple or whatever um but it was if you did it was only because of your obsession goals without a mission you must be like as if you're on a mission they lack passion and they lack deep meaning think of when you had your first boyfriend or girlfriend was there a and, and, and i don't mean any physicality don't get me wrong just mentally was there a passion there just you can put your hand up if, if yeah yeah or nod what there was there was a passion in your heart in your mind in you could probably feel it in your stomach couldn't you you felt your, your, your butterflies when when you were talking or thinking about that guy or girl so goals that don't have a vision have a mission and goals that don't have passion have no meaning no meaning at all so Think about your goals, and if they don't light you up, they're not really a goal. Just forget it and move on. What else must you have? You must have PMA. Now, PMA, you, you, in the world of sales, they talk about positive mental attitude. That's all very good. It doesn't really work most of the time. Um, it, uh, that's a salesy thing. What you must have is a purpose, a method to achieve that purpose, and then you have to get off your bottom and you have to take action. Remember, Emerson said, do the thing and you shall have power. That means getting off your bottom and taking action. So many people in life do the opposite.
they have some sort of goal. They even they do all the, the, the stuff they read in the book. They write it down. They put it all around them on their fridge and on their mirror. But they don't take action. What they do is they ruminate, meditate, cogitate and contemplate. But don't get off their bottom and do it. Emerson said, do the thing and you shall have power. So action and energy are what will get you your goal. If you don't have energy, you're not going to do it. If you don't take action, you're not going to achieve it. So you must have a purpose. There must be a method to achieve that purpose. And then the actions to go with the method. There is a simple formula in the world. Um, think, act, believe, become. And I want you to take this on board. And it works both negative and positive. Works either way. Your subconscious will not uh, judge. It will simply act on what you tell it to do. Let me give you an example of how it works in the negative. Have you ever, have you ever, ever heard someone uh, in your family or friends or at work say, they go into work one day and they say, you know, I, I, I think I've got a cold coming on. I, I do. I, I, I really think I've got a cold. I, I'm, I'm feeling a bit ill. And then they start to act. They start to take Lemsip and carry a handkerchief and, and they start to take um, certain creams or pills and, and stuff. And then they really, really start to believe they, they're going to get ill. What happens literally 100% of the time? They get a cold. They think it, they start acting like it, they believe it, they become it. I'll give you a little, this is an interesting fact, a statistic. And um, there is a group of people in this world who don't get as ill as every other group. They significantly have far less illnesses than every other group of human. Does anyone have an idea? what category of person it is that does not get as ill as everyone else? I'll tell you, it's young mothers with young children or mothers with young children. Do you know why they don't get as sick and ill as everyone else? Because they don't have the time. They just don't have the time. And I've met lots of mothers with young children who say, you know what, I just don't have the time to be ill. I just don't. And it's amazing. And it works. It's strange. They have less illnesses than any other category of human being. So they think, they act, they believe, they become. Your belief system, and the belief is everything. The belief is the trigger here. The belief is the dynamite that creates everything, that explodes everything into reality. Your belief system is broken down into different levels. What you want to achieve at the bottom is the results. The only way to achieve results is by taking some sort of action, by doing something. The actions you take will be determined by your attitude. Now, Quite often, I get approached by um, big organizations, quite often sales organizations, and they contact me and they say, Gerard, we want you to come into our organization. We want you to rev up our people. We want you to do a motivating talk to our sales team, and we want you to change their attitude. And I always say, well, I'll do it if you want, but it probably won't have any real lasting effect. Because we call that, in our industry, hot bath motivation can you all remember you know if you've had a tiring day at work you're feeling stressed you're feeling exhausted and you have a lovely hot bath has anyone ever done that just to relax at the end of a day you just have a lovely hot bath um you relax in the bath maybe read a book in the bath maybe have a, a drink of tea or coffee or something else and and then you get up you go you get up you feel so lovely and tired you're ready for bed, you go to bed, you have a wonderful night's sleep. You wake up in the morning and it's back to normal. 
the fact that you had a lovely bath the night before, the effect is gone, it's worn off. So just by altering someone's attitude, it's like stretching an elastic band. It will go back, it will go back to where it was. So it's not really effective. So we have to go up the tree. To change someone's attitude, we must alter their feelings about something. To alter their feelings, we must help them with their beliefs. Our beliefs are created by our paradigms. And our paradigms are created and influenced by what we know, our knowledge and our experience. This is why there are so many different religions around the world, so many belief systems, so many attitudes, because so many people grow up in families and communities and they get told something different from when they're a young child. So for them, that becomes the truth. And that is their experience and knowledge, which turns into their paradigm. So the only way to change someone, the only way, is to help them to gain new knowledge and to put that knowledge into effect so that they have a new experience. And then it's like a waterfall cascading down. Their paradigms will change, beliefs change, feelings, feelings alter completely, their attitude changes, and boy, oh boy, they become like a heat-seeking missile going for what they want to achieve. So we used to use a phrase in my old days, and John Fielder might, might know this phrase, you light the blue touch paper and you retire to a safe distance. Uh, because that man or woman will become like a heat-seeking missile. So you and I, if we want to achieve wealth, health, love, whatever, we have to take on board new knowledge. If what you're doing now isn't working, find something new. Look at behind me. This is my library. I, and if I swivel my camera, you see every wall is covered in books. I have to... I can come out now, I suppose I can be honest in front of you all. I am a bookaholic. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a chocoholic, although I do like chocolate. Chocolate is good. I'm, but I'm not a, an alcoholic or I'm not a gambler, but I am a bookaholic. I am addicted to learning new information. And I would encourage all of you to become addicted to learning. It's one of the most joyous activities you can ever engage in in your life. So, we then need to start putting everything into action. The law of cause and effect has been spoken about by so many great men and women over millennia. In one of the great books, they talk of the law of sowing and reaping. What you put out is what you get back. What you do, Emerson in his famous essay called it the law of compensation. In the world of science and physics, we call it the law of equal and opposite reaction. But more commonly, it is called the law of cause and effect. Nothing will happen, nothing, unless you create a cause. And a cause is an action. You have to take a certain action and then there will be a return, an effect. And you have to practice with that. And remember I said earlier, activity wins the day. Lazy men and women never get the job done. So let's now look at this universe that we live in. And you need to understand that almost, and this is a horror, this is a difficult thing to say, and it's even a more difficult thing to hear. But almost everything you have been taught is wrong. You don't live in a physical world. And I know that sounds absolutely crazy because you can touch the chair you're on, you can drink a cup of coffee, you can shake hands with someone near you, you can give your family a hug. So and we have five senses, and our senses are all physical, seeing, tasting, hearing, touching, feeling, you know, um, and we, we, 
we make judgments on this world through our senses. But you need to understand that your body is simply the sheath for your spiritual self, for your higher conscious self. Um, and I'm not going to get into this in too much detail today. Um, if we had more time, I would give you evidence and facts and how to discover that for yourself. But the thing is, you are not what you think you are. You really are not what you think you are. But then another statement, what you think you really are. So you will be controlling your present and your future based on what you think, because your, your thinking influences your feelings, your feelings create your emotions, and they have a huge impact on your beliefs, or rather your beliefs, your beliefs create your thinking, your thinking creates your feelings, your feelings create your emotions, and you and I manifest our world using three things, thought, feeling, and emotion. And every one of you here is a miracle worker. You may or may not know that. You are manifesting your own world right now on a second by second basis, and you are making this happen. So if you can make this happen, you can make anything happen. So you need to take, you need to be aware. This is where it comes in, awareness. You need to be aware of what is it you are thinking. And what is that doing to you? So you are not what you think you are, what you think you are. And Errol Nightingale, a great man, one uh, back in the 1920s, he started, he and Vic Conant started a wonderful organization called Nightingale Conant uh, back in the 20s and 30s, uh, nearly 100 years ago. And they have been responsible for bringing knowledge to countless people around the world. Um, they used to produce books and then it was CD, uh, tapes and CDs and now streaming. Um, but one of the greatest secrets that Errol Nightingale talked about, and he did a, an audio series called The Greatest Secret. And although it's a many hours long, you can boil it down to this statement. You become what you think about most of the time. Now, if you're having a tough time, and finances are really, really tough, and, and you're struggling, and, and just putting food on the table is, is, a, is, is awful, it's so difficult. It's very difficult to think in another way, but you must. Because if your thoughts are focusing all the time on lack, you can't have prosperity. In order to have prosperity, you must focus on prosperity. If you focus on lack or insufficiency, then that is what you will create for yourself. So you become what you think about most of the time. And although the figures vary, there's half a dozen different surveys. One survey says we have 74,000 thoughts a day. Another one says it's about 140,000. It, 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 they vary, but the figure is huge. We have tens and tens of thousands of thoughts a day. And the, the sad fact is, the majority of people, about 70% of their thoughts are either negative or neutral or verging on anxiousness. Neutral, negative, or anxious. They're not positive. So you need to change that. You need to also understand that, much as I'm holding up this glass, and this is a physical thing, thought is a thing in no lesser way. Thoughts are things. Thoughts are causes. And you remember, cause and effect. If you create the right cause, you will experience the appropriate effect. Thoughts are things. Thoughts are causes. Therefore, you must take charge of what you think. You must be aware of what you think all the time. And the good news is, there is no lack anywhere. The universe is abundant. It's abundant with anything and everything you want. And this may sound weird. If you want health, and I guess almost everyone would like to be healthy, 
There is health for everyone. And I know that sounds weird, telling you you can tap into health, but you can. If you want love, there is love in abundance for everyone. If you want wealth, there is wealth in abundance for everyone. The universe is abundant. There is no limitation anywhere. And the law, and it is a law, therefore it has to work every time, states that everything replicates after its own kind. What that means is like attracts like. So again, you must be aware of your thoughts. If you want to be rich, you have to act as if you are. If you're in a company and you want to be a manager, act as if you are. Be that person. Be that person in your mind, in your thoughts, in your feelings, in your attitude, in your actions, in your demeanor, in your language, in the way you hold yourself, in the way you interact with others. Be that person. Even if you can't afford food, act as if you can. Be, do, have. Be it. Be it in every fiber of your body. Think of it constantly as if it is yours. Act. The do means act. Do as if you have it and you will have it. Now, I remember many years ago, I stood in front of a mirror when I was in my mid to late 20s and things weren't going well and I had a number of negative emotions and I looked at myself and I was not happy with who I was, where I was, what I was achieving or actually the truth what I was not achieving um, and I had emotions like disgust was where my life was and these can be powerful emotions so Negative emotions can be turned into powerful emotions. So emotions that can change your life, and these changed my life in one single day, are disgust with where you are. A desire, and I mean a strong desire, like a fire in your belly, a desire to change. Then you have to make a decision. And I don't mean a light little decision, you know, I'm, I'm thirsty. Shall I have a cup of tea or shall I have a cup of coffee? These, these are insignificant decisions. I'm talking about you make a decision that things will change. And proper decisions are typified by the word resolve. Where you resolve to do something. Where it's in your heart, it's in your belly, it's in your mind. You know, this is not a lightweight decision. You make a decision and you resolve to see it through, to see it through to the end. There was a, a prime minister in England a number of years ago called Margaret Thatcher. Many of you might or might not have heard of her. And some people liked her, some people didn't like her. Doesn't matter. I don't want to talk about her politics. I thought she was a remarkable lady. Um, and one of the things that set her course of action, when she was 14 years of age, her father said something interesting to her. Her father was a grocer. He owned a, a vegetable shop. And he sat her down when she was 14 and said, what do you want to do? And she was talking about her dreams and goals. And he said, Margaret, let me tell you something. He said, in life, everyone talks about what they want to do. They want to start something. They, they, they take out a membership to a gym. They start to eat healthy. They start to uh, do this. They start to do that. They go to a college. They sign up on a course. He said, everyone is good at starting things. Not everyone is good at seeing them through to the end. He said, so Margaret, I don't want you to be a starter. And this is the phrase he used. He said, Margaret, I want you to be a finisher. And by God, did she finish. First lady to ever become a prime minister in the United Kingdom. When she went into the House of the Parliament, they didn't even have toilets for ladies. Can you believe that? Didn't even have toilets. You know, it was a male dominated club and she broke that mold. So she finished. So this is where the word resolve comes in. Be disgusted where you are have a strong desire to make the change, decide what you want, make that decision, 
and have the fire in your belly, the resolve to see it through to the end. Be aware of what will then, the universe, the universe will then set a trap for you. It wants to see that you are worthy, worthy of achieving what it is you've set your heart on. And it will put, it will put obstacles and rocks in your way. And you need to be aware that they're coming so that you can recognize them and step around them and not let them negatively impact or influence you. You can see them on my screen. One will be indifference. Yo, you don't care. Another is indecision. You have periods of indecision. You will have a time of doubt. Believe you me, you will have doubt when things are not going well. You will be overcautious at times. You will suffer from pessimism. There will be times when you will be staring into the pit of doom and feeling sorry for yourself. And then the worst of all, you, you may resort to complaining. And I promise you now, every time you complain verbally, mentally, you are driving another nail into your coffin and eventually they will haul you off into a financial desert where you will choke on the dust of your own regrets. I hope you like that. So, Okay, so the goal sequence. First of all, you need to decide what are your values and you need to have a clear and I would suggest written, written out. I like to write my values in my journal and, and, and look at them now and again. But I, you have a clear set of values. What are your core values? Then you need to have a vision. You need to be able to close your eyes and see what it is you want in glaring Hollywood full technicolor. You need to see it in all of its detail. Having got the vision, you then set the goal. A goal is a subset of a vision. You set the goal. And by the way, you can have more than one goal. You know. Having had a goal, then you need to create the plan. And once you have a plan, you can then diagnose it, you can chop it, you can change it. A plan doesn't have to stay locked in concrete, you know. Um, it's perfectly okay to change and change and change as you go down the road. But you must have that plan and you must constantly diagnose. Look at how are you doing? Here you can see the various areas that you can set goals. Physical, family, mental, financial, career, spiritual, social. I would recommend you have goals in most of these. Don't just have one because they all impact each other. You know, if you achieve your financial goal, it will help you maybe with your family. It will help you with your social and, and many, many others. So they all interact. I recommend when I work with my clients that they break their goals up into three categories, short, medium and long. The human mind has got great difficulty in focusing like a laser on something beyond the three year point. Now you can still be a goal, you know, you wanna be the prime minister of a country that might take 10, 20 years, but you break it down, what we call chunk it. You chunk it down into manageable and focusable. Is that a word, focusable? An area you can focus on. So short term, one to three months, medium, four to 12, and long, one year to three years. This is an interesting quote I read, and I just thought I'd drop it in to show you all, because it shows that actually the majority of people are hugely confused. Most people are very, very confused about the world, their life, and it says here, ours is a world where people don't know what they want, and they are willing to go through hell to get it. You know, you, I've coached so many people who, and this is an old saying, they've climbed the ladder of success, they've got to the top, only to find the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. Does anyone know what I mean by that? Um, yeah, they've climbed the ladder of success, maybe they've taken 25 years to do it. They've got to the top, 
they have a title, they have a position, they have money, nice house, big car, whatever, only to find they are empty inside, empty. There's no joy. They, they always believe for 20 years, happiness will come when I get there. And it doesn't. Only to find the ladder of success was leaning against the wrong wall, you know. But yet they went through hell over 20 or 25 years to get to where they are. They sacrificed relationships, children, parenting, so much. So this is coming back to my earlier slide, know what you want. So you're going to get a recording of this. So if you can't write it all down, don't worry. And I'll send my PowerPoint to Pauline and she can send it out to you guys and girls. So don't worry too much about spending time writing. You can see this. Step one, write it down. Even if you don't like writing, write it down. Okay? It's not a request. It's a direct order. Write it down. Write down exactly what you want. Determine how you will benefit. Why do you want that? What's the benefit going to be to you? Analyze where are you right now on the road. And if it's nowhere near at all, be crystal clear in your honesty with yourself. Be brutally honest. We have a division uh, in Noble Manhattan called the Alpha Group. And we have a saying when we talk to business leaders that they need to confront the brutal facts. That's, we use that a lot. Confront the brutal facts. So be absolutely brutal and honest about where you are right now. Then put a date on it on when you'd like to do this. Identify the barriers, obstacles, challenges that might be in your way. You don't have enough money to get there. You don't have enough knowledge. You don't have the education. You don't have the contacts. Write down, what, do you, what are you lacking? List the people who could be of great help and service and benefit to you. None of us is an island. You know, everything is people. And the wonderful thing about people, 99% of people are good. 99.9% .9 of people are really good. And almost everyone will help. If you ask people for a bit of help, a bit of support, a bit of encouragement, they will help. Oh, by the way, I don't have a slide on this, but while talking about that, there are two types of goals. Go up and give up. Go up and give up. You should share one, you shouldn't share the other. So a give up goal is one where you want to, for example, give up smoking or give up alcohol or lose a bit of weight or, you know, that sort of thing. You want to give up um, something like that. It's perfectly okay to share those goals with family, friends, neighbors, colleagues, and so on. Because then if you, if you fall off your goal, they can remind you, oh, you shouldn't be having that cigarette or are you having that cake? I thought you wanted to lose a bit of weight and that, and that can be helpful. But there is a type of goal called a go up goal that you have to be very careful of sharing, very careful. A go up goal is where you want to improve yourself. You want to improve your life, your finances, your position in the world. You want to maybe move up in the company, move up in the world, move up financially. You have to be so careful who you share those goals with. And you should only share those goals with people who love you so much that they truly want you to benefit in the world. And even your best friends may not be appropriate. Because when you tell your friends suddenly you want to change, what you're really saying is you want to move out of where you are. You want to be different. And they're comfortable where they are. And they may not like that. And a thing called jealousy can creep in. So go up and give up. Share the give up goals. Be careful who you share the go up goals with. So number seven, establish how you are going to get the knowledge and skills you will need to move forward. Write down what books you need, what courses, what seminars, what, what do you need to know that you don't know in order to get where you want to go. And then develop an action plan and take action. So to, to cut it down, there are five vital steps. 
And you'll notice the first one isn't go without. It's not deal with the world out there. The first crucial step is you go within. You go into the inner world. That, that world where you create everything. That microcosm, that inner cosm, the macrocosm we live in is merely a reflection, a mirrored image of your inside world. How do, you, how do you change the outside world? You first of all change your inner world. You cannot change the outside world by making changes in the outside world. It has to go within. So you go within and you do that by forms of meditation, spending quiet time with yourself. You visualize, you create a desire, then you strengthen your belief, you build your belief. There are many ways, one very effective way is affirmations, and I'll show you how. And then you have to show gratitude. You've all heard about affirmations. Most people get it wrong. Affirmations have to be in a certain way. The first thing you have to do, the very first, you've all heard, I, I, I've heard it in so many courses, I've re read so many books, and they say it's, oh, the PPP, affirmations, the PPP, right? It's got to be present time, positive, personal, and so on. And that's sort of true. It does. But that's not the whole story. That's the middle bit. So an affirmation should be present tense and with feeling, positive and with emotion. It should be personal, that means it's specific to you, and balanced. But you need to, what we call, top it and tail it. You should start an affirmation with a statement of truth, and you should finish an affirmation with a statement of gratitude. What is a statement of truth? You see, let's say you have no money at the moment and you are poor, and you suddenly say, oh, you know, I am incredibly wealthy, an affirmation like that. Your subconscious will actually look at you as if you're crazy and it will say, don't be so stupid. No, you're not. And it won't listen to what you're saying. So you have to, in a way, manage your subconscious first by making a statement of truth. And I learned this about 14, 15 years ago, and it had a dramatic effect on the power of my affirmations. So a statement of truth could be as simple as two and two equals four. Then you make your affirmation and then at the end you show gratitude. And I'll show you how to. Here's a couple of examples of affirmations to do with finance and money. So you'd make a statement of truth. You know, I am, I am six feet tall. I am prosperous, abundant and bountiful. And then at the bottom in red, this I willingly accept. That's the statement of gratitude. This I willingly accept. So you make a statement of truth, you have your affirmation, and then statement of truth. I've given you four affirmations here that I know from personal experience are incredibly powerful at drawing wealth to you. Number one, I am prosperous, abundant, and bountiful. I am prosperous, abundant, and bountiful. I am prosperous, abundant, and bountiful. You say it with passion. You say it with emotion. I attract money and wealth from all directions. And you can say this in a number of ways. I attract money and wealth from all directions. I am a money magnet. Wealth wants me. By the way, two of the most powerful words in the world, in fact, they probably are, the two most powerful because they are a statement of creation are the words i am because you're stating to the universe you're not saying oh i'd like to be oh wouldn't it be nice oh if only you're saying you're looking the universe in the eye and you're saying i am and it's the most powerful statement of creation that you will ever have so it's a good thing to start your affirmations with I am. I say my affirmations when I'm brushing my teeth. I say them when I'm driving my car. I say them in my mind when I'm on my motorbike. I say them when I'm on flying on a plane. You don't have to say them out loud. 
you can just say them in your mind like a mantra. I'm sure you've all heard the word mantras. And you, remember, you, you, you just remember them and they start to go. You can say them 20, 30, 50 times in a row. I am prosperous, abundant, and bountiful. I am prosperous, abundant, and bountiful. I am a money magnet. I am a money magnet. I attract money and wealth from all directions and sources. This I willingly accept. And it's so powerful. And by doing that, you're taking charge of your thoughts and the direction of your thoughts. But you must stay committed. Commit, commitment, listen to this, look at what I've written. Commitment is continuing to do the thing you said you would long after the mood in which you said it has passed. It's easy to be committed when you're feeling on top of the world. Real commitment happens when you are not on top of the world. Only a few more slides. I think I've got 10 minutes left according to my watch. You should, every human being, there's over 7 billion of us, we're all different, we're all unique, we're all special. Every one of you here right now has a definite purpose in life. And I would recommend that you spend some time and discover what your purpose is. It would be such a shame to live all of your life and get to the end and not realize what you were put here for. Now, people, 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 people. People will be either your greatest asset or your biggest liability. Some people, it is good to be around. Some people, it is not good to be around. Let me tell you that right now, staring you in the eye. There are people out there, it is not good to be around. There are people out there who are, they have bad thinking, they have bad language, they have bad attitude, they have bad emotions, they have bad beliefs that will hurt them and hurt people around them. And you should not associate with people like that. So there is a law, the law of association. And the questions on the right hand side are good questions. Who am I around? So who do you hang around with? I learned from Brian Tracy about 20 years ago, most people's income is an average of the five people they spend most of their time with. Isn't this interesting? Most people's income is an average of the five people they spend most of their time with. So who are you spending most of your time with? Maybe you need a different group of friends. So ask yourself the question, who am I around? Next, what are they doing to me? And finally, is that okay? And if it's not okay, we go to the left and we apply the law of association. And there are some people that you should practice disassociation from. They're not good to be around. They will hurt you mentally, physically, emotionally. They will drain. Have you ever, have you ever been with people and after spending half an hour with them, you feel drained of energy? Has that ever happened to anyone? No? Hands up? Yeah. And you, you go away and you've just had, a, all you've done is have a coffee with them and a chat. But you go away and you think, oh God, I feel so tired now. I feel my energy is gone. Deepak Chopra calls them vampire and energy suckers. He calls them vamp energy vampires. So there are some people you, you should not associate with at all. There are other people, yeah, it's good. It's okay to be around for a while, limited association. And then there are a very special group of the people who you should have ex expanded association you spend more time with they will build you up they will make you feel good they will help you to raise your eyes your vision your game your thoughts your emotions and have better and higher beliefs so look around so again we come to this belief energy oh focus I just lost my, yeah. So belief, energy, focus. You need to have the belief. You need to get off your bottom and take action. So you have the energy. And then you need to focus like crazy on that. 
oh, I've just lost my slides. I don't know what's happened there. That uh, doesn't matter. So we're nearly at the end. And finally, the very final slide is what we call the DPTNL formula. Decide what you want. Be crystal clear. When I'm with my coaching clients, I have a phrase I use with them. I say, I want you to have crystal vision. It, it, the, the word say it all. You need to have crystal vision. Decide exactly what you want. Then you have to pretend you've got it now. You've got to trick your, own, your subconscious. That's where affirmations come in. They trick your subconscious into thinking you've got it now. And the subconscious will create miracles and it will orchestrate people, places, things and opportunities around you to make it consistent with your major dominant goals and your major dominant thought patterns. You need to pretend. You, in the acting world, they have a phrase, don't they? They say, fake it till you make it. So you do that. Then you should treasure map it. What we mean by that is put it all around you. Put pictures, put statements on your bathroom mirror, on your desk, on your wall, on your, in your car, everywhere. You treasure map it all around your house, your office, your living quarters. So wherever you go, you see it. I did that with cars in the early days. Nowadays, I, I don't care about cars, but when I was a younger man, you know, I wanted special cars and, and all of this. I did it with my, motor, my current motorbike. Um, and it, it's exactly as I treasure mapped it. I went online, I got pictures, I, I printed them, I cut them out for them, and I let the world, I let the universe then work out how I got it. I didn't worry about how I was gonna get it, and you shouldn't either. So you treasure map it, and then, 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 you tap into your subconscious. And this is by spending quiet time, meditating, time on your own every single day. I, I am not a Buddhist, but the Buddhists say, they've got a wonderful saying in their religion, they say, if you ever give yourself one gift in life, give yourself the gift of meditation. And I would have to say, that's so true. So, 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 so true. Right, I'm, I'm coming up to my time. I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And does anyone have any questions? First of all, it was amazing, I think. And we have a question from Anesia. Before she just left, she had to leave and she asked, what's your best Facebook? My best sales book. Actually, it's not a sales book. It's not a sales book. Because sales are a, are a function of applying techniques that exist in, in the natural world, in the spiritual world. So it's more important to learn how the world works rather than some glib sales technique. So some of my favorite authors are people, and there's so many, because they, they, these are all mentors at different parts of my life. Earl Nightingale, one of the originals. Then you have people like Jim Rowan and Brian Tracy, who are magnificent. And then you've got, on the scientific spiritual side, Greg Braden and Bruce Lipton, and men of that ilk. Um, I remember you told us one about a, a book, which was about sales. Of the oh, there are. There are some good ones on sales. And um, what I'll do, I'll come up with a couple. So when I send you an email, Pauline, with these I'll slides, I'll, I'll put them. Yeah. So the floor is yours, guys, all the questions. If you don't want to speak up, put them in the chat. Otherwise, please unmute yourself. No, they don't want to talk to me, Pauline. No, no they love you. They're just amazed. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead. Okay, Serene. I'm first. I'm so grateful to be part of this. Um, like these are things I really like. These are things I've been thinking about for so long and working towards. And it just feels like everything makes sense because I'm I'm just meeting the right people and attending the, the right talks and just hearing the right things. But my question is, the people that drain your energy, what do you do if they are related? Yeah, it's family. And it happens. It's quite common. 
they might be a very close member of your family. And, and you can't just suddenly divorce yourself from your whole family, you know. Um, so what you simply have to do, you have to first of all, be aware. Be aware of what that person is doing to you emotionally and physically, because our emotions affect us physically. They can make you sick, they can make you ill, give you headaches. And, and so. so be aware of what that person or people are doing to you emotionally and the effect it's having on you and just start to practice a little bit of separation as much as you can without being horrible without being nasty um, and start to put in some boundaries you know? is it physical separation like for example let's let's assume, or just state it's a parent it just drains me so i i've actually limited physical contact to once a week because i cannot stand it like I cannot stand more than an hour a week. It drains me. So like I've, I've kind of, I, I call on the phone, and, but I can't like be there physically more than an hour a week. Is that, is that healthy? Because like sometimes I feel guilty, but um, the, the, it's, the guilt is better than the, the drainage of energy. It it, you are, there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. There, there's an old saying, oh, I, I can't remember who said it. Oh goodness, it'll come to me. They said, you must practice extreme self-care. So you must practice caring for your mind, your emotions, your feelings, because that creates your universe. So no. Thank you. Also for nothing wrong there. No. <laughs> Thank you. Ara, now you had a question. Hello. Hi, Sarah. How are you, Claren? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Always glad to hear your talks. So it's so amazing. <laughs> All right, I just wanted to double check on something. Um, and the importance of uh, having uh, the, the visualizations, and the importance of writing down the personal vision. Yes. Uh, how much do you think, because I, I have uh, I've written my personal vision a couple of days ago that covered, that had to cover my spiritual health, my physical health, uh, my relationships, uh, my uh, career, everything. How much do you think this would help to oh, you personally? Let me let me show you. Let me show you something. I'm here in my library, and I am a huge believer in keeping a journal. And I have a. I have a book, I have a whole series of them, and if you can see, it's called Journal. The Journal. And this is one, this is an em empty one, I haven't written in this one yet, but this one, I'm just getting to the end, and it's absolutely filled with bits and bits I've torn out of notepads, and I don't want to show you on camera, in case you read any of my stuff, but, <laughs> um, and I, I just, I'm a huge believer, Sarah, in spending a little bit of time every day writing down your thoughts, your feelings, and keeping a journal. It's such a powerful thing. So I would strongly recommend you do that. Okay. And it talks about the resonant relationships in our lives, like, you know, like just to make sure that every person in your life, a circle of friends, a circle of, uh, of uh, your partners, your children, your parents, everything, and to double check. So I think this is, uh, I feel so positive because of that. And now with this talk, especially about the money, it's, it's so inspirational, knowing that I don't have the healthiest relation with money, but I'm working on it. So <laughs> this is really good. It, it, like we say in coaching, it's a process, Sarah. It's a process. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. We have a question from uh, Lama and says, what is your uh, best advice, Gerard, for self-care? For self-care, again, it comes to awareness. Being, most people are not aware, strangely enough. They're not aware of themselves. They're not aware of their environment. They're not aware of the people around them and what their environment or people are doing to them or the effect they're having so the most important thing is to raise your awareness and um i i, I teach uh, with a colleague of mine scott millway we teach a thing called primordial sound meditation um 
part of the Deepak Chopra organization, but th there's a phrase we teach people, you know, W-I-G-O, what is going on? And then what is really going on? So people need to be, you know, think of yourself like looking around all the time and you don't have to do this, but just looking around, being aware of what's happening around you and being aware of the effect it is having, a, having on you. And then you'll know what to do. You will practice disassociation or limited association, or there are some people, it, it is so good to be around. You spend more time with them. Thank you. So awareness is the key. Awareness, definitely. We have uh, indecision. What if you're stuck between a rock and a hard place? Meditate on it. Go within. The answer always lies within. Wow. And, it, and by the way, don't worry if it doesn't come like a bolt of lightning after, the, after you spend five minutes meditating, you think, oh, this doesn't work. No, no, no. You have to practice it a little bit, you know. But go within, spend time inside, not outside, and uh, the answer will come. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, in, there's a thing to help. In coaching, we have a thing called values or values elicitation. By doing a values elicitation on yourself, it will help you massively to, to make a really good decision on what you want to do, what you don't want to do. And in fact, I, I, I might be wrong here, I think you are going to be running a masterclass um, in July on the 7th, 8th or something, two days, 7th and 8th, and you're going to be doing some real live practice coaching um, with real observation and feedback. Is that right? Yes, yes. It's That's good. going to be from six o'clock to about half past nine at night on the 7th and 8th. And is that, yeah. is that on Zoom? Yes, it's on Zoom. So uh, everybody... Can, can people join in? Yes, I will share. When I share the recording and the uh, slides, I will share the link to the Zoom as well to the master class. Okay. So, Any more last minute questions? We have thank yous for this beautiful time and shared wisdom, Gerard and the organizer. Thanks very much. I have to leave. Got another Zoom. I have a question. Can I? Now, yeah, go ahead. Hello, Gerard. How are you? Hi, I'm great. I'm great. Sorry, I can't. Sh I can't show you my pretty face. My hair is inexplicable. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I'm having so, a bad hair. I haven't had a haircut for three months. It's looking so bad. That's that, that's the Corona effect. So <laughs> my question, my question is, somebody asked me quite a while back, like maybe six or eight months back. He was saying, "Are you doing the things that you love?" And I was like, "I don't know." And then he said, "What do you love doing?" And I couldn't answer. I have absolutely no idea what I love. Okay. I, what came up to me that day is what, well, what I've been doing is, I think what we've all been doing is, oh, sorry, maybe people around me, is we are in survival mode, right? Because of Lebanon and the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I really do not know what makes me happy. So how do I... Ah, okay. The exercise to find okay. That? <laughs> that, that's such a good one. Okay. I'm going to give two answers. First of all, don't make the mistake of thinking that your life is going to be 24 hours a day of bliss. It's not. All of us, all of us have to go through a period of hard work um, to get where we want to go. You know, I remember I was in America once and someone said, you know, oh, I don't want to. I was talking to a young guy and he said, oh, I don't want to get a, a job flipping burgers in, a, in McDonald's that's beneath me. And I said, really? He said, yeah, what do you think of that? I said, my thought is flipping burgers in McDonald's, we call that opportunity, you know? And we all have to have times in lives where we do stuff that we don't particularly want to do, but you gotta do it to put food on the table and to live. And it's, it's part of your road and it's not who you are, it's simply, it's simply what you are doing. What you do is not who you are. Do you all take that on board? What you do is not who you are, okay? And we all have to do things that do, do not give us any great pleasure, but it's necessary to feed our children and keep a roof over our head. And so now we come to um, what gives us joy or uh, 
what would make us really happy. In coaching, there's a simple question. You know, you'd say to a client, what do you want? And you'd think that would be such a simple question. And yet so many men and women scratch their head and they say, I don't know. I don't know. In fact, that's the problem. I don't really know what I want. And if you're in that camp, in that position, don't worry. It's so normal. So what we do, we start with two things. And it's a journey, so don't worry. It, it, it's very enjoyable. First of all, we start with what don't we want, because there are two types of motivation, um, uh, uh, towards and away. If, if you know what you want, that's what we call towards. Oh, I want a million dollars. I want a red Ferrari. I want this. I want that. Right? But a lot of people don't. But they, if they don't know what they want, they almost certainly know what they don't want. They don't want to be ill. They don't want to be poor. They don't want to be on their own. They don't. So we can start with what they don't want and build on that. So that's one very good way of doing it. So start to write down what don't you want in your life. And then we can flip okay. it around to say, well, what would the reverse of that be? The, okay. other, thing, the other thing is, what I said to, uh, uh, a, a minute ago, is a values elicitation. There is an exercise you can do in the coaching world, and I'm sure you can find it, called a values elicitation, where it helps you to make a list of all of your various values, and then you start to superimpose one over the other, one over the other. And the question is, if I could have this, but not that, would that be okay? And then if I could have this, but not that, would that be okay? And eventually, you might start off with 40 or 50 values, and eventually you get down to literally three or four. That, and we call those core. These are now your core, core values, the things that really mean such a lot to you. Um, yes. And I'll tell right, you a story. Thank, I, thank I, you. If I may have, a, if I may have a, a, a one minute, uh, please forgive me. Please. I had a client called Bruce. Bruce was a family man, married with two young children, and a very religious man, brought up in the church. And he wasn't a minister, but he would go to church every week, take his children. He would, he would volunteer at the church. He was just a very, very um, church-oriented individual. He had a job wife, two children. He came to me for coaching because he wasn't achieving what he wanted in life. And I said, well, let's do a values elicitation. We took, we took two sessions of nearly two hours each to do this, four hours, a week apart. And when I first said to him, tell me, what are the important things in your life? He said, oh, my God, my church, my family. I said, fantastic. What else? And then we went into other things, other things, other things. He wanted some travel and money. He'd like to be financially independent. Da, 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 da. But he said, no, the, the most important things in my life are, are my God and my church and my family, my wife and children. I said, okay, great. Well, at the end of four hours, it turned out that his most important value was recognition. He wanted to be recognized in the world for doing something. His second important, most important value was financial independence. And his family came third, and the church came about 10th. And he broke down. He broke down in absolute tears. He had a cathartic moment. He was emotionally disturbed for about a week because he came to a true realization that what he had, what he had said to the world all of his life, these are my what's important to me, was stuff that he'd been told by his family. It's stuff that his community had told him. He had grown up, he had been conditioned to believe that that should be his priority. Now, I'm not saying right or wrong. He made all the choices. And he suddenly realized, actually, recognition and a feeling of significance as a human being himself was the most important thing. He wanted financial independence so he wasn't struggling. And it shocked him and it really upset him. And then he came to terms with it. And then he was a changed man. I've never seen anyone change like it in my life. And, 
and he went on and he loves his family and they now are, have he's, he has created incredible financial independence um, and, and all sorts so my answer to you is a values elicitation exercise will also help you immensely to find out what you do want and where your passion lies. Thank you very much for that, Gerard. It was excellent. Thank you. Sorry, I'm, I went off on a bit one. So. That's fine. Anyone else before we finish up? Time for last question. Anyone? Okay, thank you all so much, everyone. It's been lovely thank to spend you. time with you. And I look forward on when this whole world changes and I can travel there is again. One last question. Okay. There is one last question. Let's take it. Lama, unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, Gerard. I want to thank you for this uh, insightful talk. But I, wa I have one question. Uh, do core values change with time? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, positively, they change. And okay. I, I look back at the journals I wrote 20 years ago and the things that I was so, so keen on achieving in life. And I look at them now and I think, my God, why was I wanting to achieve that? And nowadays, it is of no significance at all, some of these things. That I, but, but 25, 30 years ago, oh my goodness, they were the center of my universe. That was, that was what I was aiming for. Now, I, I wouldn't get out of bed for them, you know. In those days, I wanted money, I wanted cars, I wanted big houses. Now, I couldn't care less. It's different things altogether. I hope that... How often do you recommend somebody to do the value elicitation exercise? Well, every year, every two, I, I, three years or more? To be honest, doing it once a year is not a bad thing. It takes a couple of hours. It's good to do it with someone else. Someone else asking you the tough questions is better than you asking them yourself. Because you will, I don't mean this to be horrible, but you will, um, you will lie to yourself. You will rationalize things. And when you, when you rationalize, you are telling yourself rational lies. So it's better to get someone else to do it with you. Thank you, thank you. Okay. I'm going to say goodbye, everyone, now. Interesting note in the end. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And we're going to send you the recording and the slides. And looking forward to seeing you in our next CSGs. You're always welcome to join us. Have a nice afternoon, evening, whatever, wherever you are. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you for that, Pauline. Really appreciate it. Thank you. One second. Hello, Gerard. That was.